And now that we understand the law, the covenants, and who enforces them, what are my client's actual options to enforce a covenant? Well, put simply, Mel, generally speaking, there are three options in, when you're dealing with covenant and rules enforcement. And they are self-help, fining, and court action. And with the other, actually, with the notable exception of towing, we do not recommend using self-help very often. In fact, I generally have my clients avoid self-help because it's generally dangerous these days. I don't like it because it poses a very serious threat of physical harm by an irate homeowner. Having said that, however, there are a few occasions when it might be appropriate to take, undertake self-help where the risk is minimized, such as mowing an owner's lawn or dealing with landscaping issue when an owner fails or refuses to do so. This is very common these days with the mortgage and real estate crisis because the mortgage companies have foreclosed on so many properties and they haven't yet figured out how to maintain them. Sometimes self-help is necessary to resolve an emergency situation, oftentimes in condominiums pipe break, and you need to get into those units. Those documents give you the right of access to get in and solve those problems, and not only that, charge the cost of the repair back to the unit owners. Lastly, uh, towing represents the most commonly implemented form of self-help, and while I discourage clients, again, from generally using self-help remedies, I don't have a problem implementing towing issues and self-help. For a, uh, for a multitude of reasons. First, the towing is undertaken by the third-party contractors equipped to deal with the irate owners. The, um, the towing is actually usually regulated by a local ordinance. Almost every county has an ordinance on the towing. Um, third, it's not undertaken without prior notice. And fourth, um, it's almost impossible to cite any other means of enforcement to resolve the disputes. 11113, it really isn't going to work in a covenant violation where somebody's parked uh, an example in a fire lane. You can't let that vehicle sit there. You have to do something now and you have to tell. Okay. Now, can you explain how the fining process works? Sure, no. Most condominiums and homeowners associations have a fining process that mirrors the provisions of Section 11113 of the Condominium Act, which essentially mandates procedural due process for the offending owner by requiring prior notice, an opportunity to cure, and a hearing before a fine can be imposed. Again, note that unless a homeowner's association has a finding process in their documents, there is no similar statute to 11113 in a homeowner's association. And except with regard to towing in particular, I find that finding is the most cost-effective process to resolve disputes because it's fair, it allows for the resolution of disputes without needing lawyers such as myself, and if the matter isn't resolved through your own finding process, you've built the case for me, given the owner due process, and allowed me to hopefully prevail on the case down the road. The finding process itself is generally relatively simple, and I'm going to walk through 11113 of the Condominium Act. And in short, um, you're sending a cease and desist letter, you're sending a notice of a hearing, and then you're holding a hearing. But you need to dot your I's and cross your T's. When you're sending that cease and desist letter, you have to note in the letter specifically the alleged violation, the action required to abate the violation, a time period of not less than 10 days to cure the violation. If they then continue to violate the community's documents, you have the right between day 11 and day 365 to get to the second step in 11.113, which is to send them a notice of a hearing. And in that notice, you must include the nature of the alleged violation, the time and place of the hearing, which can't be less than 10 days, an invitation to attend the hearing and produce any statement, evidence, and witness on his or her behalf, and the proposed sanction to be imposed. And then at the hearing, the owner has the right to present evidence and cross-examine witnesses, and the board holds a little mini-trial. Um, and the board then makes a decision looking at the facts. Is there a violation of the community's documents or isn't there? And then they have the right to fine that owner, a monetary sanction. Um, in most communities, I like there to be an initial fine to wake the owner up and then a daily fine to get the owner to comply. And you can use that as leverage to get them to comply by a certain date and say, if you get it done by that date, we'll drop the case and we won't turn it over to the attorney. Otherwise, we're going to turn it over to the attorney, we're going to seek the attorney's fees, the fines, and we're going to be seeking this court order down the road to get you to comply with the community's documents. Um, a board also has the right to restrict the common areas or the common in, in an HOA setting or common elements in a condo setting. They can block an owner from using the pool or the basketball courts or whatever other recreational facilities a community has. They have the right to block them from voting on certain issues such as amendments or who gets elected or who gets removed on a board. And you also potentially have the right to charge costs back to that owner through the hearing process. I guess I'd also note at this point it's also very important to sometimes um, get your community attorney involved in self-help issues or finding processes because if you're not dotting your I's and crossing your T's, that will hurt your case down the road when you give it to me. And I can't tell you how often I've had cases turned over to me where the steps weren't done right in the first place and it ended up hurting the case down the road. At that point, Mel,
filed, there would be no other option but to file a complaint in the circuit court where the community is located. And at that point, you'd be seeking injunctive relief from the circuit court requiring an owner to do something or abstain from doing something. This, of course, is the last option for a board of directors because obviously everybody knows attorneys aren't cheap and it can be a costly process. How much it would cost depends on the reaction oftentimes from the homeowner. Some homeowners will resolve a dispute after receiving a letter from our office. Some will resolve a dispute after, re after being served with the complaint. And some after the discovery phase, and some of them require you to go all the way to a full-blown trial. So it oftentimes varies a lot. We have cases that are, again, resolved at the early stage, and some that go all the way to full-blown trials. But in general, the law is stacked in favor of a community association, and almost all the time we prevail in those cases. And not only do we prevail and get the remedy we're seeking, we get an order uh, requiring the owner to pay the fines back that were imposed, assuming you had the right to fine, and we recover the attorney's fees, presuming, again, that the community has a provision allowing for the recovery of attorney's fees. In a condominium setting, 11.113 of the Condominium Act, if it's applicable, has a provision regarding the recovery of attorney's fees. There is no similar statute in the HOA Act, so you must have that provision in the community's declaration or bylaws to allow the judge to give you those attorney's fees back. Um, in this line of work, I've seen court orders requiring an owner to remove issues such as fences, sheds, pools, siding, extensions, and the like. I've also seen a court require an aging owner to wear an adult diaper, and I've seen a court actually order an owner removed from a property because she couldn't control her behavior despite an order already requiring to do so. The examples can go on and on, but the important issue here for the audience is that the circuit courts will enforce these covenants uh, if none of the less restrictive remedies work. Now, what does the association do if the governing documents do not give the board the power and the tools necessary to enforce the covenants? Well, then we recommend the community amend its governing documents. In a condominium setting, that means that they must amend their documents and usually, uh, the bylaws, I should say, and it's usually a 66 and two-thirds vote, which is the fallback provision in the Condominium Act. In an HOA setting, it usually means amending the declaration. However, there are certain circumstances where you could create or modify the bylaws to address these issues, but we'd have to look at that community's documents to make that determination. Um, and in general, amending an HOA declaration can be anywhere from a 50 to 80 percent requirement, while the bylaws usually can be amended by a majority of a quorum of owners, which oftentimes is only 10 percent. So if you had a community of 100 owners, you might only need 10 to show up and then 6 to pass an amendment. So that, thus the reason that those amendments generally should be in the declaration. It's often very easy to amend the bylaws. And in the context of any amendment, again, the most important consideration is that you're not seeking to create, modify, or omit any um, provisions that would conflict with the hierarchy that we talked about earlier. So again, the rules and regulations can't conflict with the guidelines, and the rules and regs or guidelines can't conflict with the bylaws, and the bylaws can't conflict with the declaration. Craig, are there any overall big concepts that the board should understand about covenant and rule? Now, yeah, there are four main general concepts that I have uh, in dealing with covenant and rules enforcement, and, and they're relatively simple. The first one being never, ever, ever selectively enforce. If you are pursuing a person about an unapproved purple shed, as an example, you better enforce that provision against the neighbor down the street with the same problem. In other words, don't treat your friend any differently than the guy you don't like down the street if you're on that board of directors. Treat everybody the same. This goes the same, by the way, whether it's collections or the covenant enforcement or anything. And for the record, this is the best defense any owner has in any covenant enforcement case. If you are selectively enforcing, it's going to be very, very difficult for me to win that case for you. The second one is sort of a similarly related issue, and it is never abandon the covenants. You just can't say that you don't like a covenant and you don't want to enforce it. To do so is prima facie evidence of the board of directors breaching their fiduciary duty, which they have an, an obligation to do. So if you have a provision that prohibits recreational vehicles, you better do something about that recreational vehicle parked on the street. Because if you don't, you're not going to be able to prohibit another owner parking a recreational vehicle in that community. The third one is understanding the applicable statute of limitations and a doctrine that we know called the doctrine of latches. And basically it means that you have to act within three years of when you knew or should have known of a violation, otherwise you lose the right to enforce the covenants. And the last one is be reasonable, be reasonable, be reasonable. As long as board of directors attack all of these issues in a reasonable fashion, the courts will not second-guess decisions of the board of directors because they're protected by what's known as the business judgment rule. So as long as the board hits these issues in a fair and amicable, ma amicable manner and makes those decisions reasonably, there are no problems and the courts will generally enforce these covenants and the community should prevail. Well, that was excellent advice. <laughs> I'm thank a, you, Bill. I'm out of pages. And I just want to thank uh, Craig uh, Zaller.
uh, Nagel and Zoller, and, uh, and if you have not had the opportunity to hear him give this full presentation at a CAI event, I encourage you to do so. Uh, thank you again, and we look forward to... Uh,